Bochot Abaot, ladies, and welcome to another weekly edition of our Torah classes. And if you're logging on to the incredible Torah site for women, olsara.com, or if you're logging on to the enormous holy site of Torah anytime, or if you're a YouTube subscriber, thank you so, so very much for tuning in so diligently every time we post a shiur. You have no clue the merits that are being accumulated by your Torah study, as well as the donations that you're giving so generously for the promotion, distribution, advertisement of, and spreading of Torah. Hashem should continue to bless your efforts. And as we know, we have a Purim campaign that's running now, and I want to thank every single one of you who has come through so beautifully. You know, I can't even describe the feeling to you every time I wake up in the morning and I log on to our Ohel Sarah email and I see all the generous donations, whether it's to the mikvah, our local mikvah, holding that up, maintaining it, um, whether it's to Torah hours, which really pleases me the most, to be honest with you, because that's really the most important, the spreading of Torah, whether it's just to help needy families, whether, whatever it is, that giving to my rabbi in Netanya to help him with his congregation, your generosity and your love for Hashem is noted in Shamayim, and I can't thank you enough. Uh, the Perm campaign will run through the end of Adar, and we are collecting money in order to survive the next few months until the end of the summer. So thank you to all who have been so gracious and kind. This week's Shi'u is sponsored by the Holiday Shear by Shoshana Vanderhoek from the Netherlands. Shoshana, we love you. She's an avid student of mine taking all of my classes, all of the private classes, the Bereshit classes, the Perm classes. Thank you so very much, Shoshana, for your beautiful heart, for your gracious nature, for your big soul, and for always, always being there for Ohel Sarah in every possible way. Thank you so very much. I thank you and your husband, and I wish you tremendous bracha, blessings, hatzlacha bechol ma'ase yadech, tremendous mazal, parnasa, tremendous sustenance, b'shefa, it should come pouring down upon you like, a, like, like the, the rains that fell like a mabul. Health, happiness, and all the good in the world. Bezat Hashem to you, Shoshana, thank you so very much. And to those who help to partake in this lecture, you know, you can also help to partake. Like our dear Wen Huang. Wen, I don't know if you're a man or a woman. Can you let me know? <laughs> so that in the emails, when I send you a beautiful letter, I can address you appropriately. But thank you so very much. Thank you to Imelda Sijenche. I hope I pronounced that correctly, for partaking in this lecture. To Shelly Abadi for partaking in this lecture. And thank you to David Wolf who partook in this lecture but made sure to write in the notes in honor of the Rabbanit. So, so special of you. I thank you so very much. Please answer Amen to the following people. First of all, for Zivug Agun, Bela Esther Bat Sarah. We want her to find her soulmate, Bezat Hashem, very soon. Bela Esther Bat Sarah. For the Refua Shlema, the speedy recovery of Rachel Sarah Bat Chaya. Meira Sarah Bat Freidel Chana. To the Refua Shlema, the speedy recovery of Chaya Freida Bat Leia Fega. Yair Emanuel Ben Gabriela. For the speedy recovery of sadly progressing stages of cancer of a 65-year-old woman, Dalia Bat Alice. To the refua shlema of Yaakov Yishai Ben Naami. To the speedy recovery of Johanna Wankmuller. We hope to hear good news Bekarov Mamash. Mamash, very soon. To the speedy recovery of my mother, who unfortunately wasn't feeling well this past week, let us wish her a, a, a really speedy recovery and all of her tests should go well. Mercedes Masouda Bat Estrella. 
and to the regaining of complete vision in both of his eyes, a speedy recovery, to Tzvi Avigdor Ben Leia Zalmanovich. Okay, also, let's see what else we have here. For the Ilui Neshama, the elevation of the soul of Tzvi Mayor Ben Avram Alevi, Allah Shalom, and to the elevation of the soul, Elui Nishma John Jack Edward Pring, Alav Hashalom. For the Yatzlacha, for the success and the recovery of our hostages, especially to Adam Berger and all those who are still trapped in the claws of the enemy, may they be released immediately in Sir Amen. For the success and conversion, for the conversion of Elisheva Bat Shayan, Hadassa Bat Shayan, and David Ben Shayan, may they grow up to be holy Jews, strong Jews who love Torah, who love Hashem, and never waver from the path of the Torah and of Akadosh Baruch Hu. Their conversion should be speedy, and we should see them here in Eretz Yisrael, Bekarov Mamash, with their mother, Shayan, who we love so very much, is also a student of mine in all of my classes. To the health, success, Parnasayim, Bracha, Tishmol, Megisha, he should find a job very, very soon. Shem should help him with sustenance. And to the health, success, and Bracha of Malki, Bat Shulam. There was a special dedication today uh, so beautiful that read uh, that they, these people, uh, unfortunately, we deleted the email before we could write this down, but I was so, I forgot who it is, but such a beautiful dedication that says that the donation was made for Klal Yisrael, for the Jewish nation, that they should be together Be'achdut, and for the uh, Aliyat Neshama, which means the elevation of the souls, of all those who fell, unfortunately, during this entire war period. I want to thank those people who have donated to Torah Hours. Thank you to Moishi Palik, to Shelly Abadi, to Saadia Ramirez, Jack Pring, Shelly Krivulin. Thank you to Ashley Volmar, we love you a thousand hours, we love you. And to Jacqueline Bohan, 500 hours. Guys, you have no clue. I love when you sponsor for Torah hours because that means we keep going and we keep maintaining what we already have. And we could spread a lot more Torah. Thank you so very much. And thank you to those who donate. And you don't have an email, whether, you, uh, whether it's by, by regular mail to our Brooklyn address in the United States or if it's through PayPal, but you weren't able to put an address. Thank you to Yelena Grinman, to Sigalit Amiri, and to the Carrera family, who I so much appreciate. They send us money every time with the most beautiful and inspiring letters to our Brooklyn address. Thank you so very much. And we grant anyone in the Carrera family who needs Yeshuot, any salvation and a refuah shlema and a speedy recovery, it should happen bekarov. This week's shiur is dedicated in honor of all the donors around the globe, including Shoshana Vanderhoek and all those who partook in this lecture. All of you, all of you out there who have helped to support Ohel Sarah, who have assisted in the promotion and the spreading of Torah throughout the world, May Hashem keep you safe from harm and protected. May you see His divine providence as clear as the light of day. May you experience blessings from above, mazal, health, happiness, and all the good of this world and the next. May all your requests be fulfilled if it is pleasing to Hashem. And may your kindness and your generous giving spirit allow you to witness the coming of Mashiach in our generation, soon in our days. Amen, Ken. Yehi Ratzon. Thank you so very much. This shiur is dedicated to you, to every person who has responded to the Perm campaign, to our local mikvah, to the needy families, to our soldiers, to my rabbi in Netanya, to Ohel Sarah itself, to the hours of Torah. Thank you so, so very much. My dear friends and students, next week we are going to welcome 
the month of Adar too on the calendar, which means that Purim is just around the corner. So in honor of Purim, we are going to analyze some key points that appear in Megillat Esther so that we could appreciate the holiday and understand the mysteries behind the occurrences. The Rambam, Allah Shalom, Maimonides, in the laws of Megillah states something fascinating. Listen to his words. He says, Kol sifrei han all the books of the prophets, v'chol ktuvim and all the scriptures, atidin lehibatel be'yemot ha-mashiach, are destined to be nullified during the times of Mashiach. That means that all the books that we're familiar with, Sefer Yehoshua, Sefer Melachim, Sefer Shoftim, they are all going to be placed in Geniza. They're going to be put away. The only Sefer, the only book according to the Rambam that will endure in the times of Mashiach is Megillat Esther. That is unbelievable. Megillat Esther is going to live forever. And then the Rambam continues to write the following. The Megillah will be eternal just as the five books of the Torah are. And just as the laws of the written oral Torah also are forever. That neither of them can be annulled. Not the five books of Moses and not the oral Torah, not the Talmud, not the Gemara. So too, Megillat Esther, says the Rambam, is the one holy scroll from all the other books that will be eternal. And then the Rambam states that Purim will be celebrated even during the times of Mashiach. Wow! That means we won't be celebrating Pesach, Sukkot, or Shavuot, at least not in the way we have throughout the centuries. All other Chagim will be placed aside. The one holiday that will remain is Purim. And then the Rambam quotes a Pasuk from Megillat Esther to prove his point. What does it state in the Megillah at the end? And these days of Purim shall not be revoked from amidst the Jews. And their memory shall not cease from their descendants. This is what the Megillah states. Purim is forever. The question is why? What's so special about Purim? and Megillat Esther. But we don't even see any open miracles in the Megillah. Even though the story of Purim is very interesting and dramatic, there aren't any clear or obvious supernatural miracles in the story. It's a story of a series of seemingly natural events. There's a king who hosts a feast and executes his queen. There's a beauty pageant. There are villains who plot to assassinate the king. There are anti-Semites, villains, and heroes. There's reward, there's punishment. Somebody gets hanged in the end. But nothing in the story stands out enough for us to say, well, wow, that was amazing. What a shocker that was. There are no flying carpets. There are no magic wands. There is no sea that splits or heavenly plagues. There's nothing supernatural at all in the Megillah. Think about it. It's, it's quite natural for kings to host banquets, and very natural for Jews to have enemies. It's normal for the king to want to reward Mordechai for saving his life, and it's quite natural for Ahasuerus to listen to his beloved queen Esther's pleas. It's also routine for a king to have enemies that want to assassinate him. In other words, everything that happens in Megillat Esther, if analyzed superficially, seems as if it, it, there's nothing out of the ordinary or spectacular that took place. So a story that by nature is very natural and not as dramatic as Yetziat Mitzrayim, as the exodus from Egypt, but that story is going to remain forever? Forever? 
I mean, if we're discussing the era of Mashiach, leave us with the best story of all. We have so many incredible events that occur throughout the course of Jewish history. Leave us with the best one. What about the story of Avnei El Gabish? Does anyone know what happened over there? While the Jews were doing battle against their enemies, suddenly rocks began to fall down from the heavens and crush the enemy. Wow, now that's an amazing miracle. Yet that miracle won't be mentioned during the times of Mashiach. Which miracles will be emphasized? Which story and who will be highlighted? Esther, Mordechai, and the Megillah of Purim. Really? Yes. That's what it says in the Megillah itself. V'zichram lo yasuf mizaram. Their memory shall not cease from their descendants. This story remains forever and ever. So my goal today is to try to prove to you met methodically that while there are no open supernatural miracles that occurred in the Megillah, there were nevertheless miracles that took place almost every step of the way. And if we look closely, we will see the signature of Hashem everywhere because there are no coincidences in the story of Purim. So let's begin with a question that's posed in the Gemara of Chulin. The Gemara asks, Esther, min ha-Torah minayin, where is Esther's name hinted to in the Torah itself? Not the Talmud, in the Torah itself. And the Gemara provides us with the answer. Where is Esther's name mentioned in the Torah? She's actually mentioned in Parashat Devarim, where God warns Am Yisrael saying, Ve'anochi haster astir panai bayom hahu. And I will surely hide my face on that day. HaGadosh Baruch Hu tells the Jewish people that there will come a time where he will hide his divine countenance from them. This is referring to a time in Jewish his history where Hashem will be working behind the scenes and we're going to have to look very hard in order to find him. So let's analyze Megillat and S Esther and see where HaKadosh Baruch Hu hides himself. So from the onset, the Megillah tells us the following. Bishnat shalosh lemolcho, in the third year of Ahashverosh's reign, asa ha-melech lechol ha-am ha-nimtzaim b'shushan ha-bira, the king hosted a party for all the inhabitants of his land in the capital, Shushan, and we are notified from the beginning that what? Al kiseh malchuto asher b'shushan ha-bira, that the throne of the kingdom was situated in Shushan, the capital. Now, Shushan isn't such a famous place on the map. Today, it's called Hamadan. It's in Iran somewhere. Now, have we ever heard of that place? No, but it was once a very small village filled with Iranian fundamentalists that lived there. I don't know what's happening there today, but in any case, in the story of Purim, the real Persian capital was actually moved to Shushan. Why? The Midrash Rabbah of Esther explains that Achashverosh saw the throne of Shlomo HaMelech Alav HaShalom and he was awed by this sight. As some of you know, Shlomo HaMelech had a very unique and large throne that was animated. It was mechanical. It was quite an amazing throne to behold. So Achashverosh hired the best carpenters and contractors to replicate the throne of the wisest man in the world and the greatest king of Israel, Shalomo. And the factory for the production of this throne was located in the city of Shushan. So Achashverosh sent the blueprints for the throne and then the construction began. Three years later, the throne was finally completed and Ahasuerus requested that the throne be transported to where the capital was situated 
at that time. And the workers, they said, well, well that's impossible. Well, we cannot ship this throne over here. It's much too large. It's unmovable. This throne has to remain in its place. What did Ahasuerus do? He thought about it and he concluded the following. If they can't bring the throne to me, I'll move to where the throne is. So he moved the entire capital to Shushan based on what? A chair. But I, now I ask you, is that not the strangest political move you ever heard? You decide where the capital should be based on where a chair is situated? Imagine that. That's unbelievable. Why did that even have to happen? You know why? Because the Megillah tells us that Ish Yehudi Haya Bishushan Habira. There was a Jewish man living in Shushan, the capital. Now everybody assumes that Achashverosh moved the entire capital to Shushan because of the throne. But that's not why he relocated. The throne was just the catalyst for the move. He was moved by God because Mordechai lived in Shushan. That's why Achashverosh had to be situated there. The entire story of Purim is dependent on Mordechai, one of the heroes of our story. So HaKadosh Baruch Hu shifted the entire world to revolve around Mordechai so that the story could take place in exactly the way Hashem wanted it to happen. And in order for God's plan to come to fruition, he put a ridiculous thought into Achashverosh's head to replicate Shlomo's throne. And it just happened to be that the men who manufacture such a throne lived in Shushan. And suddenly they decided that they couldn't ship the throne. And then Achashverosh is stuck having to, to relocate the capital to where the throne is, which is Shushan. Now we're reading this, and we know this is all God's doing. Now is this an open miracle? You know, but it is a miracle nonetheless. It's a miracle of occurrence, and it's one of the first dominoes that Hashem puts on the Purim chart. After that, Achashverosh decided to host an elaborate banquet. Now the Gemara of Megillah tells us that Achashverosh was a Melech Pikeach. He was a smart king. And the Gemara proves it by stating that the party, he held it in Shushan. Why was that a smart move on the part of Achashverosh? Because if a rebellion would ever take place, it would most likely occur in Shushan, in the capital. Why? Because there were people living near the palace. So it would be easy for them to rebel and overthrow the kingdom of Achashverosh. So Achashverosh decided to soften the hearts of the people by hosting this extravagant feast in Shushan. So he turned himself into the most benevolent king in the history by inviting every person in Shushan, rich or poor, from the lower class to the elite of his capital. They all attended the party. And he allowed anything and everything to take place at this party, if you know what I mean. Now, it was at this seven-day banquet that Achashverosh did one of the most foolish things that a king could ever do. He summoned his wife to appear in front of all the guests wearing her crown and only her crown. Are you serious? You're a king who's supposed to maintain the dignity of the queen and you summon her to appear before the commoners of Shushan in the most undignified manner? Now, if you think about it, besides Vashti, his queen, the one who'd be shamed would be Achashverosh himself because he's the king. He'd be embarrassing himself. What a tipesh, what a fool you are. You're getting drunk and this is how you treat the queen of Shushan? By making a mockery of her? So Achashverosh had this insane moment. And remember, 
that if this ludicrous idea would not have entered his mind, there would be no Purim story. Esther would not have been chosen queen. We'd have to close the book and begin our Pesach preparations. So this crazy idea of a Hashverosh was the next domino that was placed on the Purim chart. Again, is this an open miracle? No. But if you think about it, it's very rare that something like this should occur. Now, interestingly, the Gaon of Vilna, Lava Shalom, writes that Vashti, she had no problem showing up uh, to the banquet in her birthday suit because she wasn't the most modest woman to begin with. So why does the Megillah tell us that not only didn't she make an appearance, she was appalled by, by the idea. The Pasuk states quite clearly, listen to the words, Vatema'en ha-malka Vashti lavo, and the queen Vashti refused to come. And by the way, uh, uh, over the word Vatema'en, there's a, a, a little like symbol that makes us understand that the way you're supposed to say Vatema'en, in other words, like as if she refused quite a number of times. It wasn't just once. So the Gaon of Vilna says that when you read this Pasuk, you have to place the emphasis on the right word. You see, if it were up to Vashti herself, says Lavo to come, she would have made a grand appearance. But what? It says Vatema'en Ahamalka. Only because she suddenly held herself as Hamalka, as the queen that she refused to attend. She decided it wouldn't be appropriate for her to appear this way. Before that day, she may not have cared so much. Vashti Lavo. Vashti herself, she would have come. But all of a sudden, that day, she decided to take her royal lineage into consideration. Had it not been for this sudden shift, she would have appeared. And once again, there would be no Purim story, and certainly no Esther. So it was Hashem who put the idea of modesty and majesty into the mind of Vashti to be dignified and not to appear before Ahasuerus and to be in direct contempt of the king's command. So we see how God was once again placing the dominoes into effect. And remember that if any of these events don't take place, there is no Purim. If, if, if there was no throne constructed in Shushan, if Ahasuerus would not have hosted a banquet over there, if Vashti would have appeared at the banquet, there would be no Purim. So Hashem was setting up occurrence after occurrence so that the slight push of the domino will cause everything to fall into proper place. Anyhow, after Ahasuerus was told that Vashti was not going to appear, he summoned his court. The Pasuk says, Vayomer HaMelech Lachachamim Yodei Ha'itim And the king said to the wise men who knew the times. In other words, he convened his court to address this humili humiliating incident of the queen not coming. Now you tell me. Does this case even necessitate a court? This is a no-brainer. Think about it. Ahasuerosh was drunk. He wasn't playing with a full deck. Uh, he asked his wife, the queen of Persia, to appear in the most immodest way in front of all these commoners. She's the innocent party in all of this. He's the guilty one. Why would he need to even summon a court? Ahasuerosh should have woken up the next day and said, Oh, God. Uh, I think I was so drunk, I don't remember anything. W what happened last night? Did I do anything stupid? Did I embarrass myself? Instead, he did something outrageous. He summoned a court to decide Vashti's fate. Now, Chachamim tell us that deep down he had no intentions of killing Vashti. In his heart, he really did want to forgive her. So if he had no intentions of executing her, why would he summon the court? Do you realize how significant it is that he called this court to session? If he would have done what's normal, which is to let Vashti go, the story of Purim would end right there. Because it was in that courtroom that Haman stood up and offered his famous advice to the king, which was, kill the queen! 
If Ahasuerus would not have summoned the court, Haman would have never offered this advice. So do you see what HaKadosh Baruch Hu is doing? He's writing the script. Enter Ahasuerus, summon a court. Haman speaks, etc. Not only that, but Chachamim inform us that Haman was the least important judge in the, in the entire court. There were seven judges in the king's court, and the last judge was called Memuchan. Who is Memuchan? The Gemara states, Memuchan ze Haman. It was Haman. So after six important judges announced Vashti's innocence, this insignificant judge, Haman, stood up and says, No, she's guilty. Kill her. Ahasuerus just heard the unanimous decision of six other important judges and in truth he was satisfied with the decision because he wanted to forgive Vashti. So the logical reaction of Ahasuerus to Haman's announcement should have been, one second, who are you? Who asked you to even open your mouth? We have six judges over here who overruled you. You really expect me to listen to you? The story should have read that Ahasuerus had a man thrown out of the court. But instead, what does the Pasuk state? Listen to what the Pasuk in the Megillah state, states. Vaitav haddavar And the matter was pleasing in the eyes of the king. Well, what just happened? Six judges told him, no, she's innocent. Ahasuerus himself didn't want to kill Vashti. And all of a sudden, because of Haman's outrageous outburst to kill the queen, he agreed? But more than this, what should have been the reaction of the other six judges after Haman's announcement? They should have been extremely offended. Usually in the secular world, when, when someone of great stature is, is, is contradicted, he's offended. The other six judges should have resented Haman. Instead, the Pasuk reads, Vaitav hadavar bene hamelech. It was pleasing in the eyes of the king, Vehasarim, and his other advisors. They changed their minds and they decided Haman's ruling was proper. That's why Achashverosh listened to Haman. So here we have another domino being placed because Vashti has to be removed in order for Esther to be proclaimed as the new queen. So in order to facilitate this new reality, HaKadosh Baruch Hu made many interesting moves. Let's proceed further in the Megillah. Achashverosh realized he needs a queen. So who did he speak to about how to proceed? You're not going to believe it. The Pasuk is a shocking one. Vayomru na'are ha-melech mesharetav. And the king's young men, he's kind of like foot servants, <laughs> said, Yevakshu la-melech na'arot betulot tovot mar'e. Why don't you seek, you know, for the king, young maidens of comely appearance, beautiful women? Who gave the advice to hold a beauty pageant? Na'are ha-melech. What's a na'ar? A na'ar is a young man, a boy, like a teenage boy. That's astonishing and most significant because the search for a new queen is one of the most important decisions a king has to make. And who's advising him on this matter? The Gen Z's, the youth committee. A bunch of 15-year-olds are advising Ahasuerosh to make a beauty pageant. Could you imagine? Imagine a president trying to decide how to minimize the inflation, and he picks up the phone and he calls the Boy Scouts. You know, uh, uh, hi, uh, could you help me? Could you boys come over to the White House? I need help with the inflation costs. It's ridiculous. They're going to decide for the king? Na'are ha-melech? And what kind of advice was this anyway? It was the worst advice you could ever offer. Go and take every maiden in the various regions of the country and other lands and bring them all to, to, to Shushan and let's have a beauty pageant. Are you crazy? This is how you find a suitable wife for the king? Usually a king who's searching for a queen is gonna, he's going to consider somebody from a well-known aristocratic and noble family. 
not someone from among the commoners. This was a ridiculous idea. And Ahasuerus fell for it. All the girls from the 127 provinces of Ahasuerus flocked to the palace. Remember that if this pageant does not take place, the story of Purim comes to an end. But Ahasuerus loved the idea of a beauty pageant, and that's how Esther made her way into the palace. Bear in mind that Esther was whisked away by Ahasuerus's soldiers. She wasn't willing to go willingly. She was even, uh, even wanted to be executed, but Mordechai told her she must go. God forbid that she should be killed, so she really went unwillingly. She was forcibly taken because she was a beautiful woman. And when she arrived at the palace and was asked where she was from, she did not provide any answers. She didn't reveal her identity. You know how embarrassing that must have been for the king? When people ask the king who the new queen is and where she's from, he's got a stutter. Uh, the, the, I don't know. <laughs> how should I know? What do you mean, how should you know? It's your queen. What is this? I, I, he's married to her and he doesn't even know where she's from, who she is, what her background is. Ahasuerus is married to a woman that won't tell him where she's from. Ah, he's loving it. The crazier it sounds, the more he likes it. And none of this makes any sense because he's a king. He's supposed to care uh, about these things, at least from the perspective of his own safety and national security. Who, it is that you, who is it that you're marrying exactly? So I ask you, is that not Hashem in the picture? Especially since Esther did everything possible to try and dissolve this union. But the harder she tried, the more Hashem took interest in her. This is indeed the hand of Hashem. Is it an open miracle? No. But it's another domino that we could add to the story. Hashem wanted Esther to be queen. So HaKadosh Baruch Hu orchestrated the most bizarre circumstances in order to secure the story of Purim. Again, there's, there's nothing seemingly supernatural taking place over here, but it's all miraculous. So let's move on to the story of Biktan and Teresh. These two courtiers join forces in order to assassinate the king. Now, a serious conversation such as this requires some form of discretion, no? Of course. But if we read the Megillah, we see that Biktan and Teresh were plotting the assassination of the king. And where were they speaking about it? Bishar HaMelech, right in the courtyard of the king. We see that they had no shame to speak in public about it because Mordechai was sitting right over there. How did they do such a thing? What was their logic? What, what, what did they think when they saw Mordechai sitting over there? You know what they said to themselves? Eh, this guy probably doesn't know our language. We're speaking in a language that barely anybody knows, so we can uh, now talk about the assassination of the king. He doesn't know what we're talking about. That's ridiculous because everybody knew who Mordechai was. He was a rabbi that sat on the Sanhedrin and knew 70 different languages. But in our story over here, these two dunce cups plot to kill the king, knowing that Mordechai, the rabbi of the Jewish people, is overhearing their discussion. And of course, what happens, what happens immediately afterwards? Mordechai runs to Esther and warns her to inform the king. Esther approaches Ahasuerus. But guess what? This is the only time in her life that she does not follow Mordechai's instructions to the T. Otherwise, all other times she was very obedient. But in our case over here, she does something different. She tells the king about the assassination plot, but she adds the following words. She says, oh, by the way, a man named Mordechai, some Jew, told me about it. Mordechai did not tell her to mention his name. But she, all on her own, decided to do that. Now, if she does not tell Ahasuerus the name of the man who saved his life, that complicates the Purim story. 
The king would have assumed that it was Esther who saved his life and Mordechai would not have been written in his book of special deeds, nor would he have been rewarded and the rest of the story wouldn't have taken place as it did. Is this not a significant part of the story? Of course it is. Now interestingly, from Esther's words, the fact that she added these words, the Chachamim made a ruling in the Gemara of Megillah. What's the ruling? Kol ha'omer davar b'shem omro. Anyone who repeats something in the name of the one who he heard it from, mevi ge'ula la'olam, brings about the redemption to the entire world. You hear this? If you repeat a Torah thought in the name of the person who you heard it from, you can bring about the salvation to the entire world. Why? Well, think of Esther. She was willing to take no credit at all for herself. And instead, she gave it all to Mordechai, who deserved it. And that's what helped to facilitate the salvation of Purim. But the point is that we once again see Hashem in the picture. Now, I also want to point out that Mordechai should have been rewarded immediately after that, since he was the hero who saved the king's life. Logic would tell us that the very next morning, after the assassination plot was foiled, Ahasuerus should have invited Mordechai to the palace and awarded him accordingly. But that's not what happens in the Megillah. Ahasuerus requests that Mordechai's name should be written in the special book of deeds, and he continues his day as though nothing happened. Now wait a second here. The man just saved your life for crying out loud. Reward him. But Ahasuerus does not do that. That's unusual. In most normal circumstances, a king immediately rewards those who saved his life. You know why? Because if the reward does not come instantly, nobody in the kingdom will have the incentive to save the king's life. Who would want to go out on a limb for the king if he doesn't even get a thank you? So that wasn't exactly the smartest move on the part of Ahasuerus. But who's masterminding the entire story? Hashem. Hashem is controlling the king's mind and he's planting this idea in his mind not to reward Mordechai immediately. Why? Because if the king rewards him now, there's no poem story. There's no domino effect. How so? Because the story continues. And sometime later, in the middle of the night, Ahasuerus wakes up and decides to go over his chronicles. It's then that he realizes that Mordechai saved his life and that he has to be rewarded. Precisely at that moment, when Ahasuerus feels the need to reward Mordechai, Haman comes to the palace in the middle of the night to tell the king that he should execute Mordechai. At the same moment that Ahasuerus is thinking of rewarding Mordechai, Haman is coming to tell the king to kill Mordechai. Now some of us might say, oh, what an amazing coincidence that was. Imagine that. But think about it. First of all, who would dream of going to the palace in the middle of the night? I mean, Haman could, couldn't wait until morning. This was very significant because if Haman wouldn't have come in the middle of the night, there would be no Purim story. Why? Because if Haman wouldn't have come, Ahasuerus would have thought of how to reward Mordechai all on his own, and Haman then wouldn't have been the one to give the suggestion of how to bestow honor to the man who saved the king's life, nor would he have been the one to execute that suggestion. So who knows how the rest of the story would have played out. So this moment here is quite significant. Again, this is a seemingly natural occurrence. It's about a man who went to speak to the king about an urgent matter in the middle of the night. But it's quite ironic that at exactly that moment that the king had a different idea in mind about the man who Haman wants to execute. So here we see the hand of Hashem all over again. Let's move on. Ahasuerus asks Haman, how should a king bestow honor upon a loyal man of the kingdom? The king knows that Haman will assume that he's referring to him <laughs> because Haman only thinks of himself. He's a narcissist. 
So Haman makes the biggest mistake of his life. Let's think. What was Haman like? Haman was a diplomat who was fooling the king for many years now. He knew how to con people and offer false flattery. And now he makes the most foolish mistake. He tells Achashverosh that the reward for the man that he wishes to honor is for the king to take the king's royal robes and let the man be dressed in them, to take the crown that the king wore on the day of his coronation ceremony and put the crown on the man's head, and then to take the horse that he rides on, also on the day of his coronation, and let the man be led through the streets on this horse. And let him be led in public for all of the people in the capital to see. Let him be paraded in the streets. Are you crazy? Are you nuts? That's what you ask for? The most important item in your eyes is the king's royal garbs, the crown and his horse? What a reckless thing to say to the king. He tells the king pretty much to dispense his royal items. This is what Haman asks for. And Ahasuerus goes crazy when he hears this because he assumes from this that Haman's intention is to dethrone him. He wants to, he says, oh, oh I see where his mind is at. He wants to wear my crown, he wants to wear my royal garbs, and he wants to be paraded in the streets on my royal horse. Now I ask you, who put these words in Haman's mouth, this ridiculous, stupid idea? Hashem. This is another domino among many that help yield the end results of this story. My dear friends, somehow Hashem's hand is hidden within the Megillah. And interestingly, Chachamim tell us that even the sin itself is very much concealed. What does that mean? Well, what was the reason that the Jews deserved to be exterminated all in one day? Most Jews thought that the gzera, that the decree, came upon them not from above, but from below. Meaning, oh, I was all Mordechai's fault because he's refusing to bow down to Haman. They thought that if he would just give in to Haman, they wouldn't have been in this terrible predicament. But what does Mordechai tell them? He says, no, no, that's not why Haman wants to destroy us. It's actually your fault because you attended the banquet of the evil Gentile king Ahasuerus. And, and your eyes and your neshama were privy to all the immorality that took place there. You ate food that you weren't supposed to eat. You belittled God in those moments. You desecrated God's name in public. And the Jews say, what do you mean it's our fault? The banquet took place nine years ago. What are you talking about? It's you who are not bowing down to Haman right now and getting the rest of us in trouble. This is all you are doing. So what we see here is that there was conflict between the Jews and the leader of the Jews, Mordechai. So how did Mordechai manage to convince them that it was really their fault? The Panovich Rav Aleva Shalom explained that when you approach someone with some kind of rebuke and you do so in a brotherly fashion, in most cases that person will listen. When a person feels and he knows that the musar, that the rebuke, is coming from someone who really cares about him, he's more inclined to heed the rebuke. Well, Mordechai was surprisingly able to make an impression on the people of that generation despite the fact that they initially blamed him for the tragedies that befell them because the Megillah tells us that he was Doresh Tov lechol amo. He sought good for his people, for his nation. So he succeeded in influencing the people because when he gave the Musa, when he rebuked the Jews, they felt it was with the intention of helping his fellow brothers. So when the Jews felt that Mordechai was coming from a place of care and concern, 
when they sensed that he was Doresh Tov Le'amo, that he only wanted the good of the nation, they accepted the reproach about them, that they attended a Hajarosh's party, and they engaged in all kinds of immoral acts, and they ate food that they weren't supposed to, and they did Teshuvah, they repented. So at this point, I want to go back to the original question that we started with. Why is it that during the times of Mashiach, this is the only story that will merit to last forever? My dear friends and students, we live in a very confusing world. We live in a, we live in a world that's difficult to decipher and to explain, especially these days. Many of us have questions about how Hashem runs His world. We want to understand so that we can strengthen our faith all the more. And life becomes even more perplexing when we try to make sense of our own lives and all the challenges that we face and every occurrence that takes place in our life. We also try to make sense of all the other occurrences that surround us, whether in the world, in our families, whether it concerns our friends, our neighbors, people in the community. And, and some of the occurrences that happened or happen to other people affect us directly because if we care about these people it will affect us. We are constantly trying to figure out why certain things happen and we don't always have answers to the questions of our life or the life of someone that we know. We're learning to live day by day especially in these days that are so uncertain but when Mashiach comes, HaKadosh Baruch Hu will sit us down kiviyachol, as if, and He'll explain to each person His destiny according to everything that transpired from the beginning of time until that very moment. He's going to show him how everything that happened had a purpose and how each occurrence of his life his life was building on the next occurrence after that. Hashem is going to demonstrate how each occurrence was like a domino and how it had to take place in exactly the manner that it did. Each situation was planned and set up for the next occurrence, for the ultimate master plan to finally come to fruition. And Hashem is not only going to show you your life, but also the life of those around you. It's then that you're going to understand that everything that you questioned was indeed merciful and just. You're going to understand why other people had to go through what they did and, and, and how that had to affect your life and why. Everything is going to be clear in this massive puzzle of life. Hashem is going to start putting all the pieces of the puzzle on the board and you're going to watch in amazement and say, Oh, 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 that's why that happened. Wow, I never realized that. And then you're going to say the words stated in Sefer Devarim. Hatsur tamim pa'alo, the deeds of the mighty, that's the mighty rock, that's Hashem, are perfect. His deeds are perfect. Kichol derachav mishpat, for all his ways are just. Kel emuna, God is a faithful God. Ve'en avel, he's without injustice. Tzadik ve'yasharu, God is righteous and he's upright. He will say, God, I finally understand. You're going to be so excited and so amazed that you're going to want to celebrate. The celebration during the times of Mashiach is going to be a celebration of natural occurrences. It's going to be the celebration of finally understanding your life in the world around you. And what better book to bring out that point than the book, the scroll that celebrates natural occurrences and how even that which seems ordinary is really predestined and planned. What better Sefer than Megillat Esther, 
That's going to be the book of the ages because everyone is going to be celebrating their own personal Megillah. You know, the Megillah, if you go through it, is a story of about 15 different strange happenings and each one appears unrelated to the next, but very much connected to the end result. And if you read the Megillah with that perspective, the only thing you could say is, wow, wow, look how Hashem made that happen. Look how one thing leads into the next so perfectly. It's like an orchestra playing in sync and creating the most beautiful music. There is not one mistake in a beautiful melody when you have such a perfect conductor. My dear friends, this is the Mishloach Manot, the care package of Megillat Esther. Everything in this story that seems so natural is ultimately handed to you in a neatly wrapped package. So you know what we're going to be celebrating during the times of Mashiach? Everyone's personal Megillat Esther. It's going to be about the story of your life. Korot Chayecha. It's going to be the interpretation and the explanation of how everything in your life happened and why it had to happen. You know, many times in Megillat Esther, you're going to see the word Hamelech, which means the king. The one and only true king is God. Hamelech, the king, is Hashem. Every time we see the word Hamelech in the Megillah, without the word Achashverosh, that's Hashem's way of telling us that He was there all along. He was behind every page in the Megillah, pulling the strings and orchestrating every event. Even though we don't see him outright, he's there. He was there incognito. This is something Shlomo HaMelech Alava Shalom teaches us in Shir Shirim, where he states, Hinei ze omed achar kotlenu. Behold, he, God, is standing behind our wall. Mashgiach min hachalonot. He's supervising from the windows. Metzitz min hacharakim. He's peering from the lattices, from the cracks. Hashem supervises this world by peering through the windows and peeking through the smallest cracks. You know, when someone is watching from the window, he can see you and you could see him. An example of this idea is Yetziat Mitzrayim, the exodus from Egypt. Hashem's hand was quite evident and Am Yisrael witnessed it and they experienced it. But sometimes the Kadosh Baruch Hu is metzitz min acharakim. He peers through the cracks. That means that he's working behind the scenes. He's merely peeking through a small opening where he can see you, but you cannot see him. And that's why the Rabbanim tell us that we don't recite the Hallel and Purim. Hallel is only recited over open miracles. The Rav Nachman Alav Shalom says that the Halal of Purim is the reading of Megillat Esther. He says, Kriyata zu halila. The reading of the Megillah is like you're reciting the Halal because when a miracle happens in a manner that's hidden and sealed, the Halal also has to be hidden. My dear friends, there's no question that we're living in the era of the end of days and that the coming of Mashiach is imminent. On Purim, when we're going to be happy and we'll be dancing and celebrating, hopefully, Be'ezat Hashem and, and coming closer to Hashem, one of the things that we should bear in mind during the festivities is that we believe that everything Hashem does is for the best. Even if we don't understand it today, we are waiting for Mashiach to come and to unravel the mysteries of life. I'm going to conclude with this story. There was a, a young orphan who lived near a bakery. Every day someone from the bakery bought him a loaf of bread. 
the young boy didn't appreciate the bread because he didn't know how it was made. He was never in a bakery. So one day he passed by the bakery and he looked through the window. What did he see? He saw the baker taking a few kernels of wheat and grinding them. Then he saw the baker turning the wheat into flour and with a little bit of water it became the dough that was needed. Then he saw the baker putting this lump of dough into the oven and ooh, popped out. Well, what a loaf of bread. Wow. He finally learned how to make bread. He was so excited that something that was hidden from him all this time, something he never knew, was finally revealed to him. Shortly after that, he arrived at a farm and he saw the farmer taking these kernels and throwing them into the ground. So he yelled at the farmer and he said, hey, stop that. What are you doing? This is wheat. This is flour. It's bread. What are you doing destroying this food and scattering all over the ground? And the farmer kept quiet and he didn't respond. But if that wasn't enough, <laughs> the boy saw the farmer take a plow and bury these kernels deep into the ground. The boy is watching this and he can't understand. He's, he's shocked. The farmer smiles and says, one day you'll understand. And the young boy says, I'll never understand this. A few weeks later, the young boy noticed that the earth started to produce layers of grass. A few more weeks passed and he saw how this grass turned into aisles of stalks. Then he saw the farmer taking a sickle and cutting down all the stalks. So the boy ran over to him and he begged him to stop. He says, look, until now I came to understand what you were trying to do, but now this? You finally got the grass to grow and the stalks to cultivate and you're cutting it all down? And the farmer said, one day you'll understand. The young boy said, what? impossible. The more I try to understand, the less I understand. And then he saw the farmer collecting the wheat. And he realized that all those kernels the farmer put into the ground grew to be thousands of kernels. He couldn't believe his eyes. How was this possible? And the farmer explained that when you plant just one kernel, you can get 10 times the amount. Wow. Now the young boy finally understood that this is how bread is made. This is exactly what happens in our world. One day we seem to understand Hashem's hand. The next day we question it. One day there's clarity. The next day, everything seems hazy. Our generation requires great faith in order to understand that whatever Hashem does is for the best. But when the time will come, Hashem is going to show us a movie that's really worth seeing. And then we'll see everything from beginning to end. HaKadosh Baruch Hu will show us everything from the beginning till the end of time. And we're going to sit there watching and say, Yishtabach Shemol Ad. Praise this his name forever. And after you're going to read your own story, your own Megillah, you are going to celebrate Purim. Purim is not only going to be about the Purim of then, but also about the Purim of now. It's going to be your Chag, your holiday. You are going to celebrate the Purim of your own life where everything will make sense to you, where you're going to see occurrence after occurrence and you're going to understand how everything was connected and how your entire life was one big series of natural miracles. You are going to see how it was all HaMelech the king you are going to realize how god's fingerprints were everywhere in your life how god's seal was in every part of your life in the most natural and hidden way and that's why my dear friends the rambam wrote that poem is going to last forever that we should be we should merit to clarity 
and the miracle of natural occurrences of our life. We should be able to celebrate soon the, the skull of our life, to see Hashem's hand clearly in our life. Amen ken. Yehi ratzon.